Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you again this morning. Even though this is a very strange way to conduct our service, uh, may the Lord bless our efforts and draw us near. May we profit spiritually from this time. Now, uh, it is the first of the month, and of course, typically this would be the Lord's Day. We would celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We're going to have to put that aside for now until we can again be together and hear the call to come to the table of the Lord. Um, I pray that uh, you would continue to uh, look forward to that and um, that uh, I, I certainly look forward to our being together again. And of course, our thoughts and prayers uh, right now go to Robin at the loss of Craig, and we ask for the Lord's blessing and strength to be with her. I know that uh, being cooped up is getting very, very old, certainly is for me, and yet I also know that there's some interesting things getting done. Um, I think in the last few days I have taken several loads to the dump, uh, trimmed hedges, uh, planted plants, uh, others are doing things around the house, uh, it's not, you know, it's a good way to redeem the time, and, uh, and that is good. Most importantly, I think it's important that we, uh, we stay healthy and we look forward to the time when this virus will be over. Now, I want to return to our study this morning uh, after taking our hiatus to reflect on uh, our current situation and uh, begin and pick up where we left off in, in our theme of living and growing in the family of God and to do that beginning our third chapter of study. Now, we've had this very unusual interruption, so let me review where we have been so far and where I want to go now. Uh, living and growing in the family of God is a lifelong pursuit and one that takes learning, growing and practicing all the way along, anticipating the next stage of life that will come to us. Now, in the first chapter of this study, we began looking at Scripture's working definitions of the words wisdom and foolishness, and then the blessings or the consequences that the Lord has built into creation that come to us naturally based on the choices that we make in our lives. Generally speaking, as Psalm 1 teaches and reminds us and illustrates for us, we are blessed when we follow the Lord's wisdom particularly as it is laid out for us in the moral law, and we are led astray when we reject it. In the second chapter, we examine the nine essential how-tos, all of them giving us practical instruction and direction as to how to live out our Christian life and Christian faith at whatever stage and whatever condition of life we find ourselves. And I want to thank Pastor Nick for giving us the majority of those lessons. Basic patterns of behavior are always important to have, always applicable and always in need of our mastering, and they are good for us to review again and again. Now, the, the third chapter we begin this morning takes into consideration the growth that comes to us by reason of our aging, our experiences, and our maturing. And by reason of the fact that as we age, we take on more and more responsibility in life. Growth also comes to us as new challenges arise with increased requirements of us. And so the key to understanding each of these stages is to learn and know that wherever we are in life, our primary task is to anticipate what is coming next and to prepare ourselves to meet that next stage when the time comes. To live according to wisdom and unto blessing requires our gaining that skill for living so that each stage benefits and blesses us in the way that we lived before, so that the ones to come will be even better. So where do we start? Well, we could start with birth and with young age, but I think the best place for us to start in this is with the institution of Christian marriage. A Christian marriage is the, the singular building block of the covenant. It is the strength of the church, 
and it is the greenhouse for the next generation. So if you have your Bible with you, turn in it to Proverbs chapter 24, and we'll read just two verses that we find there. This is the Word of God. By wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant things. Thus far the reading of God's Word this morning. Now, brothers and sisters, as you well know, in the book of Genesis, right after the Lord makes the heaven and the earth, the first thing that occurs in the providence of God is the binding of the one man and the one woman into the blessed union of marriage. God created the woman to complete the man. There was no dating. There was no trial relationship. There was no experimentation. It is marriage, generally speaking, that is God's covenant gift to his people. Now, in our day and age, the institution of marriage is being treated roughly, poorly, casually. It is even being disregarded by some, and it's being radically redefined by others. Scripture warns us not to be surprised at this, however, but rather to expect it and to be prepared to resist it, and also to be ready to repent and to change when we ourselves choose to abuse the gift that many of us have been given in the form of our own relationship to our spouse. The wisdom of Scripture teaches us a good deal about this foundational institution and how we are to prize it and practice it to the glory of God and to our own comfort. So we start with the biblical meaning for marriage and what might that be? God created man to be a social being. While all of creation reflects the character and the attributes of God, man reflects God's character uniquely, even to being exclusively made in the image of God. And just as there is communion within the three persons of the Trinity, man was also made uniquely and exclusively to commune with his God and so to commune also with one another. And to this unique creature, God gave the unique institution of marriage, a lifelong bond of love and support, a bond based on the reflection of the communion of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And just as all creation has a moral integrity, The institution of marriage is also a moral institution. This holy God made marriage to be a holy bond, and therefore it must not be treated or regarded casually or immorally. This holy bond also has a holy purpose. It is first and foremost for the support and the happiness of the man and the woman who are so joined together to give them a social and a committed companionship for life. After that, marriage is meant to provide for the next generation through continued procreation, not just of the race, but of the Church of Christ, so that through families primarily, a strong and healthy church is to grow which in turn builds and supports the society and the culture, which will strengthen the nation from inside out. Now, it is because marriage is both unique and holy that we are not surprised at seeing how the fall into sin and the foolish acts of the sinful man and the sinful woman badly affect the institution of marriage, as well as the church and the society that all depend on marriage. In God's providential and common grace, the institution of marriage can and still does work, even among couples who do not recognize, who do not confess, and do not obey God as God. 
Unbelievers can still take the institution of marriage and benefit from it and prosper by it, even while they deny the Lord who gave the institution to them. But even among Christian couples who believe in the God of the Bible, problems can still arise in their marriages too, because we are all susceptible to yielding to foolish motivations. That is to live more often than not by the old self, each wanting things to go his way, her way, so that marriage becomes for us merely a game of manipulation and power. Why do we allow that to happen? How does that happen? Well, it happens when Christians do not want to change their worldview from hedonism, that is wanting our own wants first, to one that seeks to glorify God in all things. I wonder, does that sound familiar to you? The result of not changing your worldview is the divorce rate that is prevalent in the Christian community. Even mature Christians are susceptible to a, a, a worldview that says, me first. If I am not fulfilled, if I am, not, if I am unsatisfied, if my spouse turns out to be less than perfect, less than my well-deserved expectations, if I still have time to find someone else, then I have a perfect right to break free of any relationship, of any bond, any commitment in order to find my fulfillment. Instead of that, biblical wisdom teaches us to recognize God's providential will in our lives, to bring us the companion he has at the time he has, and to seek the best from this union he has given looking for the blessings of wisdom and seeking to avoid the consequences of foolishness. That takes change in us. It takes courage. It takes faith to choose again and again and again to live to glorify God in our own lives. But if we don't, if we fail to do this during the life of our marriages, we will not only become progressively restless, progressively selfish, we will also become progressively unhappy. The world says emotions lead our ability to love, and that it's not unusual that emotions change with time, and therefore love changes with time. Scripture says that is not true. Scripture says, trust in God, trust in God's word, and that leads you to an ability to love wherever you are. So what is the biblical method for marriage? Well, there are a couple of examples, but the one I wanna focus on this morning is this. To be married is like building your own house. That's why I picked Proverbs 24, by wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. Your marriage, just like Rome, isn't built in a day. It takes years, it takes decades, not just an engagement period before you will be able to say you have had a good marriage. Marriage is like sanctification. There are days when it soars up, there are days when it crashes down. You don't know what God has in store for you. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. But you can be assured that through your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, your marriage will continue to be built day after day after day. Now, that illustration has some troubles to it. We see, merit, we see houses being built and constructed all around us all the time. Most houses being built can't go up quickly enough, it would seem. And once they are built, the new owners expect and require perfection. They want 
the craftsmanship to be perfect, the appliances to work, the yard to be green. They don't want any problems. After all, this costs good money. But that's not the picture here in Proverbs 24. This house is one of those do-it-yourselfers. It goes up slowly. It goes up daily. It goes up personally. Sometimes it goes up with great effort. Sometimes it grows up with it go it goes up with great difficulty. And it's a house that you have to live in even as the construction is going on. When I was in high school, I helped my father build his retirement home. Neither one of us were experienced carpenters. We discovered the tools and how to use them, as well as the various parts of the house and how to make them. It was an experience that we shared for three months. But I tell you, 40 years later, I still know that house well. I, I, know, I can tell you how it's laid out. I can tell you how the foundation was poured, how much insulation is in the walls, and how the wiring and plumbing run. And because we built it in the middle of nowhere, every night we pulled out our cots, we slept on site, we got rained on, we smelled the materials, we didn't have the convenience of a real bathroom until the plumbing was in and the walls were up. But because we built it ourselves, we knew it thoroughly. Marriage is like building a house. But you don't hire contractors to do this work. You get to build it yourself. With your own ability, with your own strength, with your own mistakes, with your own corrections, and with whatever time and effort you choose to give it. But having said that, really kind of fires up your own sense of impatience, doesn't it? We see real houses being built almost overnight. And in like fashion, our perception of marriage has changed. You know, throughout most of history, when a couple, when a young couple first gets married, they start out with nothing but struggle and sacrifice. Friends would throw them a shower, for example, not just to be friendly, not just to be thoughtful, but because the couple really needed the basics. But here in America, beginning with the post-World War II generation, that all began to change. A new materialistic expectation to cold. Young couples today begin to expect to start off at basically the same point that their parents were at 20 years later after all of the work and patience and growing that they put into it. Young people today want that same big house right away with its two-car garage and rooms full of furniture and kitchen appliances. What contributed to that change in thinking was, the, of course, the boom in the credit banking industry. There's no need to wait any longer, no need to build, no need to start small. You can have it all now. But the problem is that those young people also came to think and expect that their relationship, their marriage, was that way too. They didn't want to have to work on their marriage. Marriage is just another prize, just another possession. And so rather than work on that, as soon as they got married, they were off pursuing other things. They want that perfect bond right away, something they could each lean on something they could each borrow from, something they could neglect, even abuse. Marriage was something that didn't need their attention. And so when marriages began to break down, the next simple trouble-free solution is divorce. Hey, this is a fast-changing world we live in now. People's emotions change as they get older. People fall in love, people fall out of love. If this doesn't fit who you are anymore, then part company, go your own way. And as divorce became much more convenient, regard for marriage, appreciation for marriage, value of marriage became less and less a priority. But God's wisdom and God's purpose for marriage has not changed. It is the sinful, selfish heart that rejects the wisdom of God 
replacing it with foolishness. And when foolishness is acted upon, consequences do not fail to follow. And as we have learned before, with all those foolish choices come those consequences. And consequences not only fall hard on you, they are passed down to the next generation. Many of you sitting there today have not only seen the consequences and the foolishness of your own parents, but how those consequences have also affected you. And they now threaten to damage your own future, your own marriage, your own family. But none of that has to be fatal to you and to your own marriage. What it requires first and foremost is the recognition and the acceptance of the fact that a sinfully selfish world and life view does lead to failure and to consequence and to the breakdown of all that marriage must depend on and all the things that depend on marriage, the family, the church, society. And such thinking has to be rejected and replaced because of what it threatens to do. Christians must return to the wisdom of God and to seek to have and to live by a biblical view of the world. So what does that look like right off the bat? What if you are married to a less than perfect wife? Well, don't feel sorry for yourself if you concluded that your wife has trouble being that good. After all, look what she's got to work with. Look at how the world mocks and belittles her for trying to live by biblical priorities and by biblical principles. Look at how the world teases and seduces her into a worldview of feminism and independence. Be aware of how insecure and vulnerable she really is just because she has committed herself to you because she must trust you. Be reminded that she is God's gift to you and that for all else, above all else, you must honor her. Her greatest guard, her greatest shield against all that foolishness in the world is your vigilant love and devotion and security. Men, you must be about the business of building your house. But what if, you're, what if you find yourself married to a less than perfect man? Build your house anyway. Prepare your home for the future. Strengthen your bond instead of weakening it. Let me say the hard stuff even from the beginning. Ladies, submit to and respect your husband. Make your life his life. Do not grumble. Do not look back. God's word says that for all your man is not, if you will build him up, you will have strengthened him and you will have honored and served the Lord. That is how you gain God's blessings. That is how you escape the consequences of sin. Brothers and sisters, marriage is construction work. And if you are not constructing, if you are not working on your marriage, if you are not strengthening it, if you are not building it up, if you are not regarding it as precious and holy, then you are only helping to tear it down. You are undermining its foundation. You are putting extra pressure on the fragile parts. You are even deliberately seeking its failure and its downfall. But in a marriage built on the rock of Christ, there is never a day that goes by, miserable as some days might individually be, where the hope of Christ does not remain 